Okay, thanks for inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, my part of this presentation will um, be twofold. First of all, I will uh, talk a little about results from an ongoing research, research um, project where the results uh, arrive from practice and might be of value for practice. Second, I will uh, discuss structural obstacles to the dissemination and transformation of this into teachers and school leaders' pedagogical work. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, um, we, we, we've got to remind ourselves about what the European Commission says about research that researchers should ensure that their research activities are made known to society at large in such a way that they can be understood by non-specialists, thereby improving the public's understanding of science. And this is something which is demanding, of course, for us. Uh, it could be um, formulated in another way. Uh, researchers uh, in their work or research is about trying to find out what people need to know more than what they should do. And I think this conference is about this. We, as researchers, we have an obligation to contribute to practice in such a way that it develops uh, in a healthy way. In Europe, and at least in, in my country, as well as in the other Nordic countries, I would say that there has been a shift during the last two decades. Today, basic education um, has an extremely strong focus on measurement of results, rankings, accountability, and competition, and very little on its fundamental purposes in society. In Sweden, this is very, um, you, you can see it very easily. And I think today, on the 8th of November, when things are happening across the Atlantic, it's uh, worthwhile thinking of this, where knowledge and insights in the debate in, in the US uh, has not be, been a priority. It's other things that has taken place in that discussion. Uh, it's also interesting to, to read about what the OECD says about uh, results from the PISA from 2002 and onwards when it comes to, to such things as myths, things we believe in, without any evidence at all. And one such myth, this is published in the uh, OECD yearbook, 2015. One such myth is that deprivation is destiny. If you are born in a, uh, in, in a family where education is not uh, high priority, uh, it's possibly so that you will not succeed in school. That's such a myth. Another is that the immigrants drag down overall school performances. According to the OECD, this is not true either. It's all about money, and that's very interesting. When you talk about education and the costs for education, when you go, for example, to, to um, countries where, uh, which are not so prosperous as our countries here in the Nordic parts of, part of Europe, uh, they can do education but we always complain uh, that we don't have money. And that's something we, we should think of. Another thing is that success in education is about talent. That's not true either. And ex excellence is about selection. Uh, the last one is about the belief that many teachers have, and headmasters as well, that if you uh, use uh, ability grouping, for example, you will get better results. There is no evidence for such. I will come back to, to these um, factors a little later. There are two major problems which I will address uh, here when it comes to how research can be used in practice. The first one is that the ways, is in what ways purposeful research can be used in educational practice without drowning in increasingly strong flow of information. There is so much of information today coming from different sources 
so we have difficulties to sort it out. Another thing is that the problem is the extent to which alternative ways of disseminating research is compatible with university requirements for publication in reputable and high-impact journals. And this is a, a, an increasing problem at universities today. You have to publish in journals with high impact, uh, otherwise your own career might be threatened and also money to the university will be uh, decreasing. The project uh, which I will talk about here is an, actually an ongoing project. It will be finalized um, by the end of this year. And uh, it's a six-year project, as you can see. It's about a small community, small municipality in Sweden. We call it Raising Achievement Through Inclusion, and we are three researchers who have been working on it since 2010. And, um, in this research, we focus a municipality that succeeded in converting a negative trend to school failure into success. Uh, that is in focus for this project. Um, this is a, one of the smallest municipalities in, in our country, around 5,000 inhabitants altogether. There are three schools. Uh, to small schools for primary and uh, bigger school for, for primary and secondary. Um, that is lower secondary. They don't have any uh, upper secondary school in this municipality, which means that when the pupils uh, turn 16, they have to other, other, uh, either they have to commute to another municipality for, for upper secondary education, or they have to move as 16-year-olds. Another factor here is that less than 50% among the 90-year-olds were eligible for tertiary education in 2009. This is very, very low. And going back to the OECD yearbook, uh, this might be something that says that these uh, young people will have problems to succeed in schools. Around 15% of the population in this municipality had tertiary education compared with 29% in the nation as a whole in the same year. And there is a big gender difference here, just 10% among boys and 20% among girls. So the educational level in this the municipality is very low. Also, the expe uh, expectations of, of the success of the pupils is low as well, and has been for a long time. Uh, this... Um, municipality got to know in 2000, 2010 when the first open comparisons between municipalities was published in our country that their position in the ranking list of all municipalities in Sweden was in the bottom. We have 290 municipalities and the, this municipality, Essunga, had the rank 289 and 287 in two parameters. So something had to be done. Politicians in the municipality, they reacted very wisely. They said to the school and the management that you have to change the way you are working, uh, the pro professional work in, in, in school, in such a way that within three years, this trend has to be changed. And our aim, they, say, they said, is that by 2010, this municipality should be in the top of the ranking list. Do you think people believed in this? No, they didn't. Um, but they did it. And how did, how did they do it? Uh, one thing was to, to look at how the structure uh, in, in the school system was at that time, 2007. And it appeared that around one-fourth of the pupils were in small groups, not in the regular classroom. They had special education in small groups instead. And uh, they had names like the Oasis. Have you Oasis here in Denmark? You have Oasis everywhere, I think. It says much more about the environment around 
the oasis than the oasis itself. So pupils went to the oasis to get special support by special teachers. And um, they had different kinds of group, one group for the autistic children and, and so on. And in this year, 2007, they decided to, to um, abandon all these groups and take the children back to the classroom. So the classroom, the regular classroom, was the natural place for them. Even if, if, if they needed, they could leave the classroom for, for a shorter time, shorter period of time, together with a special educator or, or someone else with uh, a special teacher or what it could be. This happened. Uh, from 2007 to th 2010. And you can see here that if you look at the achieved goals in all school subjects, um, only 63% uh, had passed in 2007. The rank was 287, and the eligibility for upper secondary education was at the bottom. And then it raised year by year, and 2010, they were among the best. Is this possible? Well, this is based on their, their characters when they left lower secondary. And um, these characters should be calibrated together with the national tests. And the, the, the discrepancies between the national test result and the characters was very low. So this seems to be quite valid result, quite valid characters. Um, but what, what did they do? I won't go into detail with this, but the first thing they did, and this is very close to what has been said before here, is that they had to admit that they had a big problem. That was the first thing. They had to do something with it. So the need for change came from the teachers, the staff, parents as well, and, and also students, to do something. Uh, one uh, very important factor here, here was the leadership. They changed the structure of the leadership among staff, but also in the classroom. The pedagogical leadership was very, was very crucial. Uh, they created functional teaching teams where special educators, those who were trained in special education, were combined with those who had a more didactic or theoretical subject um, knowledge. Uh, and they engaged in research. They also decided to change their in-service training or professional de development programs. Uh, in Sweden, uh, all teachers go through professional development programs each year, uh, but they are very disparate. They, they are within so many fields. So they decided in Esunga that just two things should be focused during the coming three years. And the first thing was what they called inclusive education, and the other thing was goal fulfillment, to raise achievement in, among children. So this was the team, and all this should be based on uh, relevant and modern pedagogical research. Another factor which proved to be very important was the use of the special educational competence. Uh, before it had been placed in separate groups, and now this competence was taken into the classes and as a support for, for teachers and, and pupils in the classroom. And uh, one, of, one more thing which was very essential was collaboration between school and the social services, so that the school knew what was happening when um, students were not in school during that leisure time. I won't go into more details uh, about this here, uh, but I will say something about our research. Uh, there are two purposes of uh, the study of this research project. The first one is to examine and isolate key elements that make a difference in schools and classrooms in an inclusive work with all students, and that was the first part. This means that we didn't uh, intervene in the change in the school. I didn't know anything about it until 2010, when I was approached by, by the headmaster of, of the school, and um, 
he wanted to discuss something about a lecture which he wanted me to give. And, and he said, perhaps you don't know what has happened in my school. I didn't know anything. And he told me about this development. And my first reaction was, of course, this has to be researched. Uh, if, some, if there's anything we, we got to know about, it's uh, uh, a development like this. But this is not the only uh, aim of the project. The other one is to, to follow uh, these students after having left lower secondary during their upper secondary education. Uh, and the reason for this is that we wanted to, to have their experiences of what happened during these years in, in Esuma, the four years, the three, four years when this change was made. And we have very few, at least in Sweden, I think that is an international phenomenon, very few uh, studies where you follow pupils who have been the object or the subject of, of an intervention a long time afterwards to see what has happened. And that must be the most important. So I will concentrate more on, on this second part here now and uh, say a little about what we were doing. We collected data through statistics. Uh, we followed them semester by semester to see how, they, how their results um, developed in upper secondary. Uh, they were distributed on around 25 different upper secondary schools. So it was quite a job to find them. Uh, that was because there was no such upper secondary school in, in Esuma. And then we made qualitative interviews uh, with uh, sample of students. And that was two, two batches, two cohorts with 10 pupils in each. And there was a gender spread, ability spread, and program spread to get a more valid picture of, of uh, these students' uh, situation. And uh, the students were asked to reflect upon, in the interviews, uh, reflect upon their years in lower secondary school in Esunga, and uh, what, how they felt about being there, how they felt about having all pupils in class, those who, who for, former in the first years were in small groups when I come, had come back to their classes. And we asked them, of course, what was your feeling about this? There were autistic children, those who had big problems, and all were together. And I will uh, show you some, some um, quotations about what they said about this um, new situation. And they say this as 19-year-olds and they look back uh, at their periods in, in, in lower secondary. Once, one student says that I think you get an insight into the different difficulties for some and the extra help that some need and you know how to handle situations in the future. So what he says, or she, I don't remember, is that it gives something for yourself to have heterogeneity in, in class. It's something that you learn from. And you also learn something for the future, how to deal with differences in the future. We uh, tried to provoke, a little provoke them, by asking, was it difficult with all these uh, students who had difficulties in class? And here are three students who, who answer like this. The first one says, we had no such student in our class, so I don't know what it, how it was. And that's a very interesting answer because there were actually in her class students who were autistic uh, and had different problems. But she didn't feel that there were problems. The other one said that I have probably no such in my class, so I have no references to it directly. And the third one says that we had no one in our class, but I did not feel that there was, there was something problematic or that I heard something. There was never any problems with it. No, there was nothing that I noticed at all. So it says something about our profession, our professional uh, way of thinking of this. We, we try to avoid problems in class by separating out those who have difficulties. Uh, and many times, like these young people, they say that, well, there is no problem. We are different, and uh, we have to live with that. And there's nothing we uh, have noticed. 
And they also said during the interviews that when we are not in school, when we are together in, at, at home after school, we are together with all these people, all these young people. So why shouldn't we do that in school? That was their, their reaction. Here is um, <clears throat> a girl who had been in the Oasis for four years. And uh, when she was 13, 12, 13, she was taken back to the classroom. A 19-year-old now, she reflects about this. And she says that, so that it was in the small group, then I don't think I had passed the national exams. I passed the course that the teacher presented. It was for that group. If I had been <clears throat> staying at the Oasis, a special class, I probably would not have made the national test in ninth grade. So she's very aware of that the, the level of expectations and demands in the small group was very, very low. And coming back to class, she experienced that she could manage with support from the special teacher, of course. And now she's 19, and she um, graduates from, from upper secondary with uh, pass in all subjects. Uh, here is another pupil who says that the experience I have of people with disabilities is that the worst that can happen is you are treated as a restricted person. One should have the same opportunities and values, and the conditions should be the same, and one should have the same platform to stand on. It's a very mature way of, of reasoning, uh, and that comes from his own experiences, of course, uh, from being together with, with everyone in a heterogeneous group. A big problem among us educators is to try to motivate uh, young people and to get them interested in, in, in school. And here is a very interesting quotation. It's a boy. He's now 19. He thinks back of his, his years in low secondary, and he says that in ninth grade, we were even a group of fellows who trained for, trained for the tests to get the best results possible. So we met extra at our leisure time. It was quite unusual as well. It was, if one may call it a culture, so it was pretty, pretty strange because there were not many who had done that before. I had never done so neither. Met with friends to study. I had never done anything like that in my life before. Uh, and this was a boy which you would intuitively think would be a problem. And they started a group among his comrades looking at film, and it ended up by instead doing work for being better at tests. So to conclude this, uh, this part of the project, uh, I have three uh, statements here. Having students with special needs in class was probably an awakening for many to see that quotation, a person with a disability is actually just a person and not someone who sits in a separate <coughs> building. There was also a growth of tolerance of difference and recognition of this by students. Uh, young people seem to have a clarity about themselves, their strengths, aspirations, and their educational choices. So, the key question is, if this is important knowledge for us in a project like this, if this research is important, how can we reach teachers with, with such results? Um, and I have two ideal types here of, of, of um, doing this. The traditional approach, which research we as a researcher uh, are used to do, is to present papers at conferences. We uh, write articles in scientific journals. We disseminate at research councils. And we write scientific reports, and that's good. The problem is that we also know that very few teachers read this. Uh, it's a dissemination, OK, but it's not the real uh, way, or real transformation of knowledge or, or responding to what teachers really need and what they can take part of. 
the more unorthodox approach could be like this. Uh, a continuous intermediation to practice representatives. And this was what we did during our research. We, we assembled the uh, teachers and masters and politicians continuously in this uh, municipality to talk about and discuss our results, to, to get them to be aware of what we were doing and uh, how they respond to that. We also uh, used publications in popular scientific media. We, uh, there were interviews, interaction with stakeholders. We have given lectures, talks, and presentations. I think altogether we have, have around, during these years, we have met around 15,000 uh, listeners in different lectures and presentations. And also, there was such a big interest, of course, from, from uh, both media and, and schools around, not only in Sweden, but also in Denmark and Norway, to come to Essung and, and, and learn more. And they couldn't cope with it. It was not possible to, for them to, to have all these people coming, visiting them. So they arranged conferences uh, where they could have 250 people at a time. And they did this 20 times together with us. So you can understand that there was quite a many which we met together with the practitioners uh, to inform about what was happening there. There was whole day conferences, around 5,000 uh, people altogether have been to, to visit this, this small municipality. And I will end up with this quotation, uh, again about what, what is valuable when it comes to research. Research becomes valuable for teachers when it's applicable to their work with students in their classrooms. As part of an ongoing cycle, teachers who study, critique, and select research do so in terms of questions that emerge from their own teaching. They continually ask, how will, wh how will what I learned from this study help my students? Such application grounds research in practice and translates the theoretical into the real. I think that's a good way of understanding uh, the recipro reciprocity between practice and research. And to sum up this, uh, this was a very unorthodox way of, of doing it. Uh, the reason why we could do like this was that it was a small budget project, project around four, five, four, four, five million kronor, which is around 400,000 euro altogether for, for the six years, and we got funding from different sources. We were not tied up with the conventional way of, of disseminating and, and doing what the, those who give you money want us to do. So we could do what we felt was the right thing to do. This meant that it took very short time from uh, the analysis of data until it was published and, and accessible for, for practitioners. So this was our way of, of doing it, and uh, I think this was something that have met the needs of practice in many ways. At least we have reached a lot of people who otherwise would pro have probably not have got into contact with this project. Thank you very much. <laughs>